<laughs> okay. Uh, hello, uh, welcome to our seventh seminar. Uh, today, we are very happy to have Boyan Yovanovich uh, to pre pre present his joint work with Zhu Wang on ideal dif idea diffusion and property rights. Um, and today, we're also very happy to have, uh, apart from our regular panelists, uh, many um, new panelists, uh, including Hugo Hoppenhain, Jasmine Habib, Vivi Chari, uh, Jan Eckhout, uh, many other people. Um, so before we start today's, uh, today's talk, here is just a brief announcement. This Friday, there will be uh, a SAMF workshop on the housing market. Um, so please uh, sign up on our website if you're interested. Okay, Boyan, I'm gonna hand over the screen to you. All right, so yeah, good to see everybody. And uh, I hope, well, I hope this is gonna be uh, worth it uh, for us. Uh, so wait a minute. Uh, Hold it. Yeah, you need to share your screen again. Sorry. I have to, I have to remove the, all right. All right, you need so to wait. share your screen again, Boyan. Am I sharing? Oh, I have to do it. You, Hold it. Yeah, you're not sharing. I, I yeah, I stopped sharing your, your screen. So what do I do now? Share again, uh, share your screen again. Oh, I gotta. Maybe escape full screen and share it. I did that. Now, now I do. Well, I'm a little bit challenged. Can you see my screen? No. No, no. Uh. Well, at the bottom on, of your Zoom screen, do you see a, a black bar which says participants, chat, sh share screen, and so on? Record, raise hand, Q and A. Somewhere on your Zoom screen. So, hold it. Slides. Okay. Ah, there you go. Um, All right. You can show out. Because I'm not used to doing full screen. Okay. I get. That's fine. Uh, the slides are nicely big, so I think it's almost the same thing. I've never, I know we do full screen in seminars, but I've never, all right. So then uh, what is, what's going on here? So this is a, yeah, it's a, we're basically to, to model an industry that evolves and uh, talk about invention and uh, copying uh, or uh, sharing an idea and um, a little bit about policy. Uh, is there too much innovation? Is there too little? Too much copying? How do we how do we do that? What's the answer? And our findings. Oops, I thought I had a findings. So the motivating questions. Yeah, those are there. Then the model. Yes, it's a competitive model uh, with measure zero agents. Okay, uh, continuous time, and there's something called an idea which you can any time invent, but it's only gonna be profitable to invent it in the, in the beginning at date zero. And then a bunch of us measure capital N of us are thinking about what should we do? Should we be an inventor or should we wait and copy somebody else later? All right? And some of us you know, in equilibrium are gonna be inventors and others are, others are gonna to elect to wait. We're gonna to have to be indifferent because we're exante, we are homogeneous, all right? Can't be much simpler. And as, as, as more and more of the imitators come in, those that elect to, to not invent, but be imitators, they're gonna start coming in. Price is gonna decline. Nobody's gonna ever want to invent anything uh, be after date zero. And price is gonna to converge to something in the long run. And that's gonna be it. You know, that, that's, that's basically the story. And um, imitation is gonna occur in pairwise meetings. Um, Sound familiar? And then uh, the imitator at those meetings is gonna pay a fee, which we uh, call alpha, but is not the Nash bargain alpha unless, uh, unless the Nash bargain share, unless uh, something happens and I'll, I'll show you later. And what now? And then we look at two regimes. In one regime, if you copy me, 
let me say this way, if I copy you, uh, then I'm not allowed, I cannot resell this to anybody else. You can keep selling your idea to other people, but I cannot. That's what we call regime one, no reselling. Regime two, uh, yes, reselling, the opposite, can resell. And that, uh, I don't know how, but there may be shades of these things going on with the, how tight protection is, but we have this drastic regime one and regime two. We'll get into the algebra almost immediately. But that's, that's what it is. It's a con continuous time model of an evolving industry, which is gonna have more and more producers in it. So the measure is gonna grow and our findings is gonna be that higher meeting rates are good, good. And uh, payment should need, not be full compensation or zero compensation because there are ex external effects that I'll mention. There's a congestion effect and there's also a spillover effect. So both of those prevent, prevent the compensation from going to 100% to 0%. Regime two, where the copier can resell the idea, is going to require that the inventor be protected a little bit more, that it'll be, be compensated a bit more up, up front. That's going to be needed because, because then later other people are taking advantage of and reselling where he instead could be reselling. All right? That's all. It's very, very intuitive. You'll see it as soon as you see the algebra. The literature is so staggeringly, staggeringly large. Some people are sitting, uh, or not sitting here, but uh, watching, I hope. Um, <laughs> but Grillicus, Mansfield, all these people show S-shaped diffusion. Disease, I, I cite not the million of papers that are written, just my colleague, Bissin, who's the only one I know that is writing on COVID. He uses the SEER model. SIR so susceptible in recurrence, which so looks just like what we're going to do. Similar, not exactly. Then there's uh, things on the, on the evolution of things, shakeout, and things like that. We're not about to shake out. Actually, we're the opposite. You'll see how, how it's going to look. But we're, we're not, we're for, for this. It's coming, it's coming later. And then, then it's getting a bit more um, search. So there's a, there's a literature on what you do when you first invest. And I remember that uh, there was a Burdett paper I didn't cite. Transplants, and then there were other, other words in, in the title, but transplants was one of them. He wrote that, and there, there was a, he and maybe Eric Smith uh, wrote that, and then there was a, you, you invest first in, your, in, in, in yourself, and then you go and you, and, and you match. And then there are other papers on this uh, since then um, that I'm not completely on top of this literature, I just know of it. Then there's the ideal sales, idea sales, where, where Baldrin and Levine said you can hand the idea to other people and uh, still be compensated and still do okay and have incentives. And Randy uh, has a paper in chat called idea sales or something like that. Only about the steady state, but um, idea sales. And uh, Mihai Manea has a forthcoming theoretical economics paper uh, with, uh, I think, idea sales in the title or something like that. Um, um, you should look at that. Then this macro stuff, we have uh, several distinguished members of that, from that literature in the audience. Perla Tonetti, 2014, and so on. Ben Habib, I don't know if he's tuned in yet. Um, and then Ugo, yes. So what a distinguished uh, audience. Um, many of you are in the, this literature slide, but I want to move on. I know how great these papers are. We'll come back to some of it in the questions, I hope. Outline, we have a model, we have equilibrium, we have the n infinity limit where we can solve more analytically. We're a little bit strapped for analytic solutions in the n finite. Capital N is the size of potential players. There's some of them are gonna be uh, inventors, others gonna be imitators and they divide themselves uh, in an equilibrium way to begin with and and that's it. And there's going to be a little, some empirics at the end. So that's, that's the outline. And then now we can begin with the model, finally. OK, feel free to interrupt. We have a competitive market in continuous time. We have an isoelastic demand curve. I always get this wrong. 
an infinitely elastic demand is beta equal to zero here. So one over beta is the elasticity. All right, see if beta goes to zero, uh, you, you can think of some of the formulas. When you see them, you can send beta to zero and they should still make sense unless things explode for case zero because then the, some of the formulas want infinite en entry in the beginning if, if, if there's infinitely elastic demand. So you have to be careful with that. that that's something to, to, to worry about. Up, uh, ahead. Now, how realistic is this? There's a unit capacity constraint. You have an idea you can produce only one unit. This is what's going to give a, a, give a, a, a room for entrants to come in and, and buy the idea or copy it and so on, because then the idea will be leveraged via its sales to other people who can actually expand output with it. Um, we are aware that this is a bit of a, uh, the capacity constraint like this, so rigid, I don't know, but that's what we have. And the only time that you decide de facto, the only time that people are gonna be indifferent, there's gonna be these capital N people, some of whom are gonna to want to invent and the rest are gonna to want to copy. And the only time that's an operative decision with indifference is that, uh, Burnett said once in the seminar, any time there's indifference, well, this is actually a bang bang, not just two actions, so forget that. You could, but anyway, anytime you have, so you have indifference at the beginning, the value of, uh, of being an innovator is gonna be equal to the value of being a copier or, or prospective copier in the future. So, but it costs you to be an innovator. You get the idea right away. You start to produce right away and you have to pay C. That's it. I don't know, uh, you know, how much there is here that hasn't, but we think we've done something on the dynamics that, um, so imitation is going to occur in pairwise meetings between our incumbents and outsiders. Each meeting, which is assumed to be between an incumbent and an outs outsider, there's no bumping in of insiders into each other. Or that. So everyone, because everyone is translated into an idea, which is gonna be produced, excuse me, which is gonna to lead to a, another unit of production, output of the, of the industry, which is KT. KT is gonna stand for the number of people that have the idea and that therefore are producing. So DKDT is the number of new producers that they T. I'm about to define equilibrium almost immediately, but right, just wanna define the values, lifetime values as of day T, they call current values, I guess, of, uh, uh, Everybody starts producing immediately, there's no delay. Once you have the idea, you start producing. V sub T, here it is, is the value of being an innovator, of having the idea and you're producing. Omega T is value of being an imitator. That may not equal VT if you're not allowed to resell the idea when you meet somebody again. If you can, they will gonna be the same, but otherwise generally not. And if you're an outsider, they're still waiting to get the idea, that's UT. So there are three present values here for innovator V, imitator omega, or that's W, I forget what it is, and this U is outsider. Over time, K is gonna rise, P is gonna fall, and these things will evolve. And basically, V and U are gonna get closer and closer together. Um, and all these things are gonna sort of, because price is falling, the things are getting devalued. So this last bullet here, it's a red herring because uh, the, nobody is going to want to pay the same thing that they paid in the beginning, that they would have had to pay in the beginning because things are getting devalued. The value of the idea is falling, et cetera, et cetera, but the cost is not being reduced. We could add some cost of imitation, ask me later about it. Not now, I'm struggling to present this equilibrium now. Is it the equilibrium slide? Not yet. Pro property rights, um, Property rights, what are they? Now, you buy the idea for a fee and we use the word share when in fact we shouldn't say share because omega is not the, uh, the rent. Uh, remember what I said on the previous slide, unless this thing U is zero of being an outsider, 
when you meet when you meet someone who has an idea and you're about to pay them for it, uh, the Nash bargain would look at the rents and so it would be omega minus u. Remember that. But as the limit goes to infinity, excuse me, as capital N goes to infinity, we study that limit later. It, it's, it's not a time limit, it is a parameter that we sent to infinity just to help ourselves solve some things explicitly. Then that will be a Nash bargain parameter. All right, hold it. And now, wait a minute. Yeah, there's these two regimes. I already talk, talked about them. In regime one, you cannot sell the idea if you're an imitator. If you bought it from somebody, that's it. All you can do with that idea is produce output. That's the only source of revenue for you. In regime two, no, you can also get, resell it. I don't know of all the various empirical, we'll talk later about the empirics. So now I can finally define equilibrium, I think. No, not yet. <laughs> ah. So now I want to motivate the, a little bit the matching function. Here's what the data are gonna show, one of the things they're gonna show, some S-shaped. We're gonna look at the early automobile industry here, and we're gonna look at the early PC industry here and we're gonna, we're gonna do something and what we're gonna do? No, let me not get into that yet. Just, I wanna no notice the S shape. And then I ask myself, okay, why did we do logistic? Is it only for the, on, why did we do the, what we did, well, I'll show you. Couldn't we have done constant returns and what would we have with it? Cause we got asked that. And so let me show you, this is not in the paper. This was, Okay, so I said to myself, let's, uh, I said to you, why don't we uh, normalize and we plot the, this thing, normalize it to one. And uh, this is what's gonna do it because think about it, it's gonna be a symmetric thing. I'm gonna, capital N is gonna be one here, only for this slide. Later, capital N is gonna be something different, very different. But right now, capital N, suppose it's only a measure one of potential people, some of whom are gonna distribute themselves one way and some of them the other way. What is the matching function between the two types going to look like? If it was Cobb Douglas, we all know that if it was symmetric Cobb Douglas, the theta would be one half. Great, we know that. Then, uh, uh, but then for us, for you and me, we're going to have theta equal to one, which we call logistic. I don't know if that's what we should call it, but that's what it is. It's a quadratic matching function. Then I also thought I would plot. Um, a little bit more curvature than Cobb Douglas, a little bit less curvature than, uh, than uh, quite a lot less, uh, more convexity in, in, in uh, so I'm gonna let theta be from half to 20. Uh, remembering that, no, I put one quarter. I know that, so that that shows you. Jude didn't, it's not his fault. This is me. One quarter, I did that, you'll see it. So, uh, so one quarter to, and then I raised it above, uh, above one, the logistic, to just to see what it would do. And this is what it does. So the blue line is, the red line is the Cobb Douglas, okay? So now I'm looking at the growth rate of meetings, the growth rate of K, depending on where you are. So here's K between zero and one, all right? And then, then the Cobb Douglas thing is gonna maximize meetings at one half exactly. When it's half and half, that's when you're gonna maximize. And the same thing is going to be our logistic case right there. If, if, you're, if you lowered the Cobb Douglas to a quarter and a quarter, then you would get something even more like this, sort of uh, like that. Whereas if you, if you raise the theta to more than, what did I say, more than one, then you're gonna get something more and more spiked. Now this is a growth rate of, of participation, so if you, if you accumulate that, that'll be where the inflection point is in the S shape. And the more suddenly it'll happen, the more spike this is, the more suddenly. So as you can see, I mean, if, it, if all that it takes is to, if, if you said, well, let me, excuse me, sorry about that. I'm gonna say, let me use the S shape to identify the, 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 the theta. It's not gonna be very precise. I'm convinced, I, I'm convinced that, you know, okay, so uh, 
you know, maybe maybe you want the blue line. What I plotted here is the outcome of the logistic, the theta equal to one case, which seems to do very pretty well, but actually the computer wants to be steeper than that, if you look at that. Whereas the automobile also looks so like so, that. So um, I'm just I'm telling you because this is something we didn't think very much about, but I wanted to show you guys because you this if anyone knows about search and matching and matching functions, well, this audience would know it. I wanted to make a contribution. So such as it is. Now, I just wanted to mention though, um, even though our, our theta equal to one has no congestion because the number of meetings is independent on how many people are with you. So how many people are in case, take theta equal to one here, all right? How many people are here? doesn't matter. If that is one, I still get to meet all these guys here. How many people are here? Again, it doesn't matter. So there's no congestion with that. But we do have congestion in the model because of the occupational choice. I call it occupational choice. But since this is partly a labor crowd, hey, occupational choice, do you want to start a firm and post a vacancy? Or do you want to be a worker and be, be part of the unemployed crowd? You impose Either way you go, you have an external effect because when you move epsilon, look at it, you go, suppose you go from left to right. So you add epsilon here, you subtract it there. You penalize everybody else that would have been happy before, now you've penalized them by epsilon. See what I mean? And vice versa. So we have, at date zero, we have some congestion. I want to explain it. All right, I don't know which dominates, depends on things, but uh, that, that's what we have. Finally, no, not yet. Logistic diffusion. So we have this. Here it is. And then we're going to have not one, we're going to have capital N, which we're going to calibrate in a certain way. You'll see. But given that, we have this famous logistic outcome. The KT is solved conditional on K0. Everything else is a parameter here, except for K0, guys. When you can reduce science to one parameter, you've really arrived. So we... <laughs> We have done that or trying, trying to do that, K0. And we have analytic solutions for K0 in two cases. If we make N go to infinity, we get it. If we take beta equal to one, we get it. If it's a unit, unit elastic demand curve, we get it. Otherwise we have to simulate for the, for the, for the logistic uh, case, but we have N equal to infinity to give some intuition for that we, we like to study that. And we'll be able to look at the solutions for K0 out of that. All right, so um, logistic diffusion. Now I can finally, yes, I, this is a definition of the first equilibrium. What is an equilibrium? Well, it's four numbers, not four numbers, one number and then three sequences, three time paths. If a mathematician were here didn't know any economics, that mathematician would be able to go from here. That's, that's what I was taught, no, somewhere I heard that, that that should be the way that we should write our papers. Randy said that, yes. Now Randy's jumping up and down, he's very happy. Equilibrium is four things. K0, an initial condition there, which is gonna be satisfying in a different condition. And then three Bellman equations, three H HAB equations. Here it is. For the innovator, let's, now let's go slowly. I wanna just check this, I said, don't know what's happened, but what happens here, regime one is only, uh, only the innovators are gonna get revenue from idea sales. Only the guys that initially chose to invent, they're gonna have all the revenue from all the sales, some kind of patent arrangement uh, it will do it. So this is why the hazard for them, so this is the usual continuous time hazard for, for V annualized. This is the revenue from selling output, P. This is the hazard. And why isn't it KT? Why, why K0? Because K0 are the original inventors. None of the guys that came later are getting that revenue. How much revenue do you get? Alpha times the shift times the value of that of that idea to the buyer, to the subsequent imitator. And then you get DVDT, 
which is going to be negative here. So all the D, U, D, W, O, it's going to be negative because price is going to be falling. Well, yeah, okay. so imitator collects omega, uh, current value. He gets also revenue, dvd omega dt. The outsider, here's his rent. That's why the Nash bargain of business, the, the share we said, has to be treated in quotations, unless u is zero. Okay, so the outsider keeps one minus alpha times omega minus u. Whether we should have done that with omega, we should have parameterized differently. Whether the analytic solutions might have been easier had we done that, I have no idea. Why is that? I don't know. But the free entry finally in the beginning, uh, you have to be indifferent because everybody's homogeneous ex ante. If you invent, um, you pay V naught minus the cost, the, the differential that you get from being an inventor on top of being a copier or put a, a prospective copier is C. That's regime one equilibrium. Four short equations. When have you seen such short equations? I don't know. Now let's see the next ones. Might be even shorter, let's see. Regime two, no, they're not shorter. So uh, hold it. So regime two is the same as the other, except that we get rid of one of the equations because now you, when you buy an idea, you become the same as the, you have the same value of it as an inventor does, because both you and the inventor can resell that idea to others. And this, now the hazard is different for the innovator. Notice that this is a KT in the denominator. We use the solution for the logistic on top, but the KT here, because now you share it with everybody, not only with original inventors, but also with, you know, bumping into the you know, originals plus the subsequent copiers, which is KT, which is also the output of the industry. Outsider, his equation changes only because we replaced omega here with V, but that's only because V equals omega. Same thing here. So only two, three symbols change between these two regimes. Moving right along then. Stop me if it's not clear. Welfare analysis. Well, so that I've explained that equilibrium is this, this simple thing just gonna evolve. What would the planner like to do? Well, the planner, he doesn't control anything except maybe K0. He can't control gamma, which is this parameter of uh, the diffusion uh, logistic. In case you forgot, I didn't mention gamma, but that's the, the logistic is, the equation is gamma times K times N minus K. This is a parameter. N is a parameter. Nothing here is under control of the parameter. Later, we talk about some subsidies and so on. But if he could directly control K0, that's the only thing. Of course, if you could directly control gamma or some of the other parameters, uh, he might wanna do something like that too. Here, we have focused on K0 and the incentives needed to, to do that. So here we talk about why not full compensation nor zero compensation extra to, to the to the inventor is, can we do just with the inventor uh, getting his lifetime value with nothing, no compensation from the subsequent idea sales? No, because this is a knowledge spillover to others that is generating. So of course you want to get some, some of that to, to compensate. However, when we estimate, when we estimate, we get, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, uh, we get 7%, 0.07, share in automobiles, 16%, if so one thing I should mention, if we're in regime two, where the buyer of the idea can turn around and resell it, that means that the original inventor is getting less. And in that case, we want him to get more of the original sale. The original sale should be 
should give him more revenue. So alpha should be larger in regime two than it is in regime one. That's intuitive. And then we estimate, uh, it's not so big, 7% for cars if regime one, 16% in regime two, nowhere close to one, nowhere close to full compensation. And we were, we were, uh, we need to calibrate in the next version, we're gonna calibrate alpha. We're looking at data. No, that's it. We're looking at papers that looked at data that at, talk about effective patent protection. But we're also looking at data, but I don't know in this context, whether we will do that. We just want to know how well are you protected by your patent? You know, and there are papers in the pharma industry and so on. How much really do you get? Because if you have 17 and now 20 years, 20 years protection, does that really mean that you get all of the data and then beta to the 21st times the rest you leave for others? No, it isn't like that. It is not people are going to invent around you. Hugo has a paper, again, about uh, another paper about that as far as I remember, with, uh, with Matt. Uh, I, could, I could have it wrong. We should have it cited as you invent around and so on. So effectively, we need to calibrate. We need a number for that. And um, if you have a number, send it to us. What should alpha be when you think everything taken, all things considered, if that's possible? Now, what? And then, of course, this congestion externality of K0 is gonna keep alpha from being full compensation. We don't wanna give full compensation because when you, when you, if you remember what I said, that epsilon that I showed you, wait a minute, hold it. Where is it? I love here. So uh, the epsilon, if I decide to be in this crowd, I, I raise myself by epsilon. I get, I, I'm one of the epsilons that come in. Then I, I make meetings more, more worse for the, the guys that are already there. I ignore that, okay? So that's just something to, to think about. Of course, this goes both ways. <laughs> Epsilon could be negative, it's positive, but uh, this is what, uh, this is how, how I was uh, reasoning to myself here. Um, oh no, not yet. So welfare analysis, I'm not done yet. So we, what? We, I talked about socially optimal alpha and it's smaller for computers. Exactly why there are more, our calibrated N you will see for computers gonna be larger, but that's something to do with it. And so I, I don't know, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Now the planner, this is something I didn't know. And Zhu just proved it more generally than what we had. Uh, he proved that everywhere in all the versions of the model that we have, a larger gamma makes a planner happier. Why does it make him happy? Because he can leverage, he can leverage the idea more easily. He can spread it over more capacity, more quickly. So of course he wants a higher gamma. Well, why didn't it occur to me? Why couldn't I have shown that? That's a good question. So, uh, so Ju just uh, last week, I think he showed this. Uh, so oh, that seems, sounds reasonable, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, but it, it'll be in the next version when, when we have it. Now, wait, wait, can I ask I, a question before you go on? Here you can. Sorry, I've never heard this crowd so quiet. Um, I, I get the, uh, the externalities through the matching makes a lot of sense. Uh, with the finite N, are there also externalities through the price that you're driving the price down by, by becoming a innovator as well, that, that, and that affects the other people, or is, is that not? I didn't quite understand the product market structure, so. I'm gonna write that down. I wish, so that's a pecuniary external effect, and you're, you're driving the rents down. Uh, yeah, exactly. All the, I guess, Howitt and, what's his name? Uh, Howitt and Agion. That's, that's where, I mean, they have this, not, they're not the first ones to have it. Pecuniary effects. All right, we'll 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 see. Right. Maybe you will chime in on that, but we certainly have. You drive the price down, and you, you pecuniary. And boy, 
it, yes. it seems, as Chris, it seems to me pretty intuitive that the planner wants gamma to be higher in regime one. In regime two, I could imagine there might have been parameterizations where that wasn't the case because then the imitators that get to copy the, the original innovators get to meet people at a high frequency and then they're selling a lot of this. Um, it's very easy for them to meet and sell. And so then maybe they would have captured a lot of the, the value and, and less of the original innovators capturing the value. And so I, I'm just trying to, maybe you have some insight in why it wasn't so obvious in, in regime two and, and why it works or, or maybe I'm thinking along the wrong lines. In regime one, I, I don't expect, uh, I, I very much expected this result. Regime two, I thought it could have maybe gone either way, but maybe it's, it's equally as easy to prove in both cases. Well, uh, I'm happy. If these things are surprising, that's good. Um, well, unless it's wrong. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll look into both these things. Pecuniary externality, without a doubt, you impose that on everybody. So um, only in first bet, only in competitive equilibrium, I, was there another question? No, I, I'm, I'm just gonna add to the comments if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of the pecuniary externality, I guess, I mean, the only choice in your model is <clears throat> the initial number of innovators. Yes. So, uh, I mean, there's no choice in terms of effort, in terms of learning or transferring knowledge uh, and so on. So. Uh, the, the only role about this pecuniary externalities is thinking about how they might impact on affecting the present value of the innovator's uh, decision, right? Yes. Uh, so it's a little bit different than, you know, what you might have thought otherwise in, in terms of the incentives that it might lead later on for imitators or knowledge transfer in general. If, in, if knowledge transfer were endogenous rather than exogenous as in your setting. Uh, regarding the gamma, I mean, the one thing about changing gamma is that it's changing it simultaneously for the innovators and the uh, imitators that are sort of <clears throat> carrying on the flag, right? And so uh, I think, you know, uh, you know the, the intuition that, you know, it might not be optimal to have them, you know, get higher gamma, probably be, might be true in the asymmetric case. Like if if when you're racing gamma, you're only racing it for the people that are carrying the flag rather than, you know, also the original innovators, is, then, you know, it, 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 it might affect, you know, the uh, decrease the, uh, the appropriation from the original in, in innovators. But I think, you know, the fact that you have it symmetrically affecting both might be part of the reason why, you know, the intuition that Chris has, <laughs> you know, would not carry through and so Chris might be right in that version of the model where the gammas would not be the same for both. I'll try to, okay. well, all right then. So I must thank you for that. It's great. We will think about it and try to figure it all out. Um, I didn't mention the other thing about the matching function that uh, the fact that, you know, uh, the fact that this is not for uh, private good makes a difference because uh, like when they do a disease and so on, you know, so um, an idea, like for example, I'm talking now and there's more than one person getting the idea such as it is. Now, if this is a the job, then only one person could get to hire me, let's, let's say. But there's a difference. So at least that much, there's a, all of you not getting into each other's way. Well, not the, the size, but there's no congestion on one side in that way. And that speaks to some, some aggregate increasing, not aggregate, but joint increasing returns in the, in the matching. There's a, Pisaridis has a paper that discusses that a little bit more with two others. Pisaridis and just this, in the context of COVID, and he's 
talking about Diamond's paper and says that you know increasing returns make even more sense for COVID than they make for for, for, for the coconut example. And then he says, well, this he says they say, the three authors say, um, you know, non-rivalry creates some sort of increasing returns. So yes, yeah, so let's, let's move on to the n equal to infinity limit. Yeah, this is it. So not, it was clumsily written. We, I didn't write it properly, the uh, so writing, but if there's a constant lambda such that this limit holds, then this limit will be true there because gamma has to go to zero as n gets large, which means that gamma times k is gonna disappear. And all you got left is, is lambda k. So, um, so what? So, so, uh, so then you get exponential. So you never reach the S inflection point. Just think about it. You know, it's kind of fine at N, you had an inflection point that goes up like for you guys, it's like this and it becomes an S. But if, if N gets so large, then the relative re relevant part is gonna be all convex. And that's what happens in our finite N version when we make N large, get a lot of convexity early on, but not all the time, you see. Okay, so in that limit, then we can solve everything. Uh, regime one is they cannot resell. Then you can solve for K zero. It's even simpler when they can resell, you get, trust me that the equations are just correctly transcribed. So here's the initial innovation. If copiers can resell, and I always ask myself, well, what if I send beta to zero, but then I'll know, because then this number being greater than one goes to infinity. I said, okay, I can't do that. So I can't have infinite, infinitely elastic demand. Not if A is bigger than RC. Even, 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 if, even if, it's, if it's smaller than RC, but it could be there's a, there's a lambda times alpha. So I have to be careful with infinitely otherwise, so that, that's the solution here. Um, this one a bit more complicated, but this is how we're gonna to get to the Silicon Valley business that, uh, oh, we concluded that if you, if you for, forbid people from reselling ideas, we associated that with um, non-compete contracts, you enforce non-compete contracts, say no, you can't do that. You can't take the idea you learned in one firm and go and use it someplace else. Can I do it? Then K zero will be larger according to the parameters that we chose there. Jules is gonna stop me if I'm, no. but then, and then the key, it's bigger than, 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 than this one here. But then in that case, in that case, the growth, the growth of the, uh, of the, of the, of the, 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 the number of the number is higher and then uh, we, we get we get overtaking. I think Jules gonna have to help me to explain this. Uh, if, if I don't, so this, this is what we, so here, here's the initial, the associate, we associate this with, with enforcement of non, the, 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 the dash line is root 128 and not, not enforcement. We don't have a deep theory of, uh, I would say of, of, of this, this is just, we said, oh, look, we can, we can have this with an initial condition going one way and the growth going the other way. But in the end, I have to I think, um, it's, um, it's, because I can see that um, and gamma different for, for, the, for the two cases. So I have to, not exactly, we haven't endogenized in this case, we haven't endogenized the growth here. We have taken two different growths to stop me if I'm talking nonsense, but this looks like two different growth rates parameterized differently to coincide with our interpretation of, uh, of what uh, non-compete is. We, we don't have non-competes leading to higher, to slower growth of- yeah, So uh, Boyan, yes. in this uh, simulation, we actually assume alpha equals zero. So the regime one and the regime two are same, but we allow two different uh, diffusion rates the lambda, which is n times gamma is different. One has a higher diffusion rate than the other one. Yes. If you have a higher diffusion rate, the initial entrance will be smaller. But 
what drives the long run growth of from number is the diffusion rate. So you can oh. see the green one actually is the, the root of 128. Uh, no, uh, no, the green one is Silicon Valley because diffusion rate is high, gamma is high. Uh, the initial ent entrance was slower, the uh, number is lower, but it will overtaking. Which formula Zhu, are we using? Are we using two different formulas or the same formula? Yeah, they're and same because alpha equal to zero. The, uh, the two regimes are same. Okay, okay. All right. So as you can see, we haven't really explained. I mean, I think it's fair to say that if we just jack up n times gamma, which are parameters, we have we have something to add to the story, maybe. But it's nice to have it anyway. And we made the colors coincide. Look at it, the green here and the green there. So we're, we're doing good in terms of paralleling what's out there. This is from a famous uh, book by Saxenian. Planner likes higher, higher. So this was the thing we discussed with Ugo and Chris. All right. So we, we, had, we had that. Now the empirical strategy, I guess uh, just a few minutes of presentation. I don't have that much more to say, uh, but I want to say that just to clarify, what is this capital N? What is it going to be? How did we do it? We have two industries. Uh, if you have trouble reading this, this is 1895 here to 1910 for the automobile industry. And it is 1975 to, to mm -hmm, 1990 something, uh, 1990 something. So the point is that these are early development. This is before the shakeout of all those things. We don't have anything to say about the shakeout. We know that there are several theories about it. McDonald, uh, Glenn McDonald uh, and me have something on that, which is related to the Uterbach and Suarez dominant design business. If you know, they said, well, automobile eventually it was uh, the assembly line that took over and then uh, it was a domino design out of the automobile, but of the way of making it, I guess, and so on and so on. So uh, that would say that everybody that committed to other things and I want, I want the next thing I'm going to do when I have five minutes, I want to take the bandit model with spillovers. That's what I want to do. There's the best arm out there. And you guys are all going to pull different arms, and so am I. Eventually, we're all going to find out where the best arm is. I might take the Bolton and Harris model or something. Is it Bolton and Harris? Yeah. Or I might do some other model of this with spillovers, and everybody's going to zero in on the best, best arm. Commitment, I'm not sure what that would mean because people, I don't have to exit. I can just switch from one arm to another if I'm permitted. But if I have somehow built the wrong arm and started using that, then uh, some people in the audience may have a model like that already. If you don't, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down this afternoon and, and write it down. Next. So this is what we did. So for, for N, capital N, we took the peak number of, of, uh, of cars, of uh, car producers. 210 here, the peak number, and 435, the peak number there. After that, there's going to be a huge decline, the shakeouts. Um, and, and what? And after we did that, then we started, we, 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 we didn't, we did numerical. So we freed up data not to be unit elastic. We did the, um, logistic case, and we, 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 we came up with some estimates. And just to be honest, so with the, with the output per firm in the automobile industry, you can see the shakeout here, it starts fairly early. Um, and then, then, uh, then this is magnified. Excuse me. I, no, this is output per firm on the other hand, excuse me. It's not, uh, sorry about that. These are two different, two different things being plotted. But this is the shakeout in the numbers of uh, number of, of, of firms that I, that I was talking about. We were talking about, we end the sample here. We have nothing to say about this uh, and hope that we still can help understand this part here. And uh, for the estimation, which uh, I think you I don't think I have much more to say about this. Did I have? No, this is not. So I think, you, um, I think you can tell them what you did for the estimation here. He took logarithm of the solution, log logarithm of the, of the diffusion of the logistic case, and then what did you do then, Ju? Yeah, yeah. Basically, we just uh, recovered the 
we estimate the parameter for the log logistic diffusion uh, using this equation uh, you have up there. And also we estimate the beta from uh, this, this page about the diffusion parameter. The next page, uh, next page is about uh, the demand estimator. We estimate the demand elasticity the beta. So then we can prep, uh, uh, parameterize the, the model and do counterfactual and get what's optimal alpha. Then uh, you already mentioned at the beginning of the talk uh, for the regime one uh, automobile industry, the optimal alpha should be uh, 7%. Regime two is 16%. That's what we got. And uh, we also do the computer industry. It's even smaller than that. Boyan was uh, mentioned the question at the beginning, why they are, the two different industries are different? Because the diffusion rate is very similar to what we estimate in both industries. So then we, we did uh, uh, some compare statics and uh, analysis, and, and we found that it's really about the beta. The two industries have very different beta. The, the uh, PC industry uh, is much price elastic uh, than auto industry. That's why the alpha is different between these two industries. That's the funding. Boyan, back to you. Okay. Well, then, uh, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, I, um, Boyan, wanted... did you, can I ask you a question about this? Oh, yes, yes, go ahead. Now you're, now you're taking the model very seriously that you're doing the data analysis with it. And now I want, I'd, so I'd like to ask you, how do you think about the assumption that each firm can, has a capacity of one? Because in the data, a firm could be some, some firms could be a lot bigger than others. Uh, there's heterogeneity right. inside. So no, firm numbers might be uh, smaller. If you take the merger, for example, the acquisition business, a lot of times some of the stuff that people do, you acquire somebody who cannot run his firm because you have an, you have the idea of how to do it better, and so you'll take him over. But then in that case, the firm numbers are not going to describe the evolution of the idea. Capacity will grow, as we say, but the firm numbers will not. So that that's one distinction in the, in the merger and the buyout. The buyout also um, mechanism that you you do it. Now in the buyout mechanism. Yeah, so maybe that's closer to what we have done. I'm just not going to write here buyout closer than merger. Buyout is kind of like that, but you, you do something, you reorganize that someone, and then you let him go again. Then firm members will become two again. Whereas if I acquire you and I reorganize it, but I keep you under my roof, then we have, we're down to one firm. So buyout versus uh, merger have two diff different implications for firm numbers even if they have the same similar implication for capacity of industry. Yeah, right. Boy, can I add on? How, how much did you hesitate about the estimating the model because the, a firm in the model is not the firm, the same as one firm in the data? Um, I, I, how much do I hesitate about? <laughs> With most models, you you know, if you start hesitating too much, you end up fossilizing yourself into the corner and you can't. So we are willing to extend. So I think sometimes it's good to just do and then, but yes, but are we willing I'm all, to- I'm also a theorist. This is all okay. I was just wondering what your thoughts were about it. Do, do you have something to add? You, you want to say something? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, do it. Yeah, so Boyan, could you go back to two slides? Show the sure. picture? Sure. The auto industry picture, yeah, this one. If you uh, look at the right-hand side of the picture, that's output per firm. Output per firm is pretty flat until the shakeout started in, in 1910. So in our sample period, output per firm is pretty constant. All the industry output growth rely on the entry of new firms. So that's why we think our assumption about the really the capacity constraint and the entry of new firms, imitators, really drives the industry output, fit the, the data pretty well. After that, after shakeout, we do see the capacity increase a lot, but this out of our sample range. We care about the early industry evolution. That's why we, yeah, how we look at the data. Thank you, that's exactly what I was. Oh, great, Ju okay. Ju Question, Boyan, oh, Boyan, Ju. This is Jerry. Uh, what does the same picture look like for the PC industry? One of the things that I think you got to be careful about is because you've got 
this dramatic increase in scale, it's hard to tell whether the output per firm is, 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 is really flat because you're, you know, you're moving from, it could be a big number in percentage terms. It might be better to present it on a proportionate scale. Yeah, Excuse we me. do have a similar picture. Uh, Boeing can go down this auto industry. Uh, Cherry was it was asking no, but, the PC industry. No, what I, yeah, what I was suggesting was that that the previous one, the auto, even the auto, it might make more sense to present the pictures on a proportionate or log scale. But anyway. Okay. Uh, yeah. What and what does the PC figure look like? Where is the PC? Where is it? I can. Yeah, go down, go down. We do have PC. Yeah, go down. Go yeah. down. Better. Yeah, this PC industry. Yeah, almost there. Yes, this one. Ah, this is PC industry output perform perform. Yeah. You can see this number is output perform. Like I think it's a uh, unit mm -hmm. is thousand probably. Sure. No, I understand. Yeah, but it's pretty flat it's until pretty the shake out arrive. Yeah. yeah. No, I, because I thought that what you guys were using the data is very useful because the alternative is, I guess I was thinking about this more in terms of specialization in trade. That is, you might think that there are some guys who are really good at innovating and developing the product in the early phase. And then the importance of the social importance of diffusion is it comes from specialization. There might be other people who might be better at routinization, commoditization, uh, selling it to a larger market. But these figures suggest that that may not be critical. It may, in fact, be reasonable to think about, uh, about the, the reason why, the social reason for having diffusion is, is always an issue. Does it come from capacity constraints or does it come because but some people are really good at one task and other people from competitive advantage, basically. You could imagine that some people are good at producing this stuff and you want to get it from the original innovators to the imitators because they have a comparative advantage in production, marketing, stuff like that. Right. Yes, I think uh, like, uh, the, the, the large commercialization, like uh, what Cherry just pointed out, uh, is part of the reason for shakeout. The shakeout is a huge consolidation that some firm can really do very well in the uh, like marketing, the like commercialization, really take over the whole market. Then we see only a few firms like, stay in, survive the shakeout. But before that, uh, people try different uh, design, different uh, uh, version of the product. Uh, they each have a, a, a constrained capacity. I, I want to make a, a point because uh, I think if you were to look at the size distribution of firms, it, you would get a very different picture because it, the fact is here, you're, get, you're getting a, a huge, humongous amount of entrance. We know, you know, from all the you know, data and firm dynamics, entrants are small. So, you know, by aggregation, you're getting in a way, you know, this constancy in the uh, average size of firms. Uh, when, notice that when precisely you get the slowdown in entries that when you start, you know, getting the increase in the average size of firms. So I think, you know, a, I, I don't think this answers the question of you know why you know capacities of firms are the same. They're not the same. Probably they're very different. It's just that you know the average capacity because of these high entry rates is, is staying relatively constant. Yeah. So for the early industry, uh, uh, for the early period of auto industry, we do some technological reason why capacity was constrained because the assembly line was introduced uh, in early 1910 right at the shakeout time, which really increased the output per firm. Before that, uh, there's still a side distribution of firm, but the, the, the variance is not very big. Because uh, even the, the best firm can produce maybe 1,000 car a year, something like that, because it's manual production. So I, I have a question. How could you change the model to get overinvestment in innovation? Is that possible? To, you know, when we're thinking of these kind of time zero investment models, is there any way to, to overdo it? Um, interpretation. Over. Alpha, you said there is an optimal alpha. If alpha is different, would that lead to overinvestment or underinvestment? 
I mean, isn't the answer, I mean, congestion here? I mean, if you have, I mean, it's like wholesale's condition, right? Depending on the alpha, you might get overinvestment or underinvestment, you know, yes. depending on how much of the, uh, yeah. So, so exactly, this is, this is uh, exactly analogous to uh, the holdup problem in the standard uh, diamond mortensen Pisarides model. Right. If if there are no if there are no uh, if there are no search frictions, then the optimal alpha is equal to one. Right. And and if there are frictions, then then uh, alpha should be something less. And and in that literature, so for example, in the Asimoglu Scheimer paper, the the congestion problem gets solved by directed search. That is to say, the, the optimal alpha comes out uh, endogenously. So I, I wonder if there's something analogous that could be done here. I, yeah, I had, a, I had a similar question. I, it's not obvious that there is a hosios condition here. So I don't, I don't even think picking the right alpha would decentralize the, the efficient solution, right? The, the right alpha should change over time. No, because the decision, so wait, the decision that was made is only at date zero. That's the only time, um, Zhu will correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, that's the only this time that in our model, there's only that. That's the only distortion that can potentially arise. No, but, but of course, when, when you're making that decision at time zero, you're, you're thinking about uh, what share of the value you're going to get at each future time t, if you uh, if you sell your idea. Well, okay. So I'll have to agree with you in the following sense: the Nash bargain will have a different share depending on the the u t versus the omega t. Do you remember that? Omega is what the uh, sure. copier gets on top of what he would have if he still had to wait. Mm -hmm. so, so that changes over time. So in that sense, you know, in that sense. What in that sense the Nash the interpretation of the Nash problem is different at different points in time, but just one alpha. I mean, one alpha is already enough to give you the optimal. As you did this, I mean, I didn't uh, play much with alpha, but he he generated the pictures in which there was a a nice interior maximum, uh, and he will correct me if I'm wrong. So one alpha is even if it's the same yeah. for all, yeah. But, but, but that's not obvious. So go back to your social planning problem. Yes. And think about the think about the choice variables as being K naught and alpha sub t. Okay? okay. Is it obvious that the solution to that problem is going to have alpha sub t being equal to alpha? That's what James Albert is asking, I think. It's not it's certainly not obvious to me. Well, it's only that. But wait, wait, look at this. The present value of incomes, which is summarized in this function v v0, u0, and omega zero. When you look at the bottom line here, that's uh -huh. all that you can influence with alphas, whatever sequence of alphas you choose. I, I agree. The question is. Take any sequence of alphas, it was just not obvious to me that you can always implement the same payoffs with a constant alpha. Maybe it's true. So it's, it's not something that, that we will out of the equations. Yeah, we will look. Can you implement with constant alpha? Yeah. Think about the social planning problem as choosing the entire sequence and then. And then you can ask yourself whether, in fact, a constant alpha implements it. Because I, my understanding of what you did was you, ser you, you searched over various alphas, constant alphas, not over time varying alphas. I mean, it makes it ugly because with time varying alphas, these differential equations have got to be a nightmare to solve. So I'm not quite sure even how I'd start doing it, but you guys are, are like, five light years ahead of me. So if anybody can figure it out, it's you guys. I have another comment. Uh, yes. I mean, there, 
I mean, in a, in a way, I mean, your the paper is sort of reminiscent of a different literature, which is a, a literature on sequential innovation, in where you know there's been a lot of concern about you know how do you split the you know the uh, the rights to innovation between you know the successive innovators in the in the chain. Um, so you know, the literature essentially about you know R and D and, and spillovers and and you know incomplete appropriation. Uh, now, in that literature, obviously the the idea is that you know the innovations are improving. Uh, they're not just you know there's not just copying, but there is sort of improvements over time. Uh, you have chosen kind of to go the other extreme, where it's it's more in the spirit of the uh, you know macro literature on diffusion, where you know these innovations are really uh, there's not they're basically it's about just diffusion about the original innovation, uh, but when we think about the data, um, right, uh, is it a fair to think that you know during those in that initial period that you're looking at maybe in an industry. Uh, that it's mostly about diffusion and that there's not really kind of sequential innovation and improvements over time? As you guys were asking the question, I thought myself, well, look at all these innovators, they, all, all these imitators, they're in the industry. Aren't some of them thinking about what to do next? And aren't some of them, so I read the Utrabak Suarez paper, which, which is just a words paper, saying dominant design. One of them came up with the dominant, one of them was one of these entrants. I don't know who came first exactly with the. So that's a, that all those people are thinking about the next stage and causing the shakeout eventually. Which is along the lines of some of the macro stuff that, 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 that's being done. I, I, I think that the macro stuff, as far as I know it, by Jesse and uh, Chris and Jess uh, is not, is, is, is constant, constant, relatively balanced. And I think uh, the stuff that I've seen by you, Hugo, and, uh, and then, uh, then uh, the Leon, uh, also constant. So, so we, our contribution is just that it's not constant. They were looking for that stuff. But in doing that, in, in trying to do that, we might have ignored some of the important Uh, one thing I would think about immediately is uh, whether the shakeout is caused by some of these guys and who, who was, uh, who invented the assembly line? Was it Ford? Who was it? I don't know. It was, yes, Ford, Ford was the first large scale firm to adopt the assembly line. But I'm trying to remember the name of this a very, a pretty good history of the automobile industry. The, the basic idea uh, was something that smaller firms had come up with, but uh, uh, but Ford was, a, was already a pretty well established, uh, relatively large scale automobile producer. I'll, if I can find the, the that history book that I remember reading a while ago, I'll I'll send you the link to that. But there is an, there are several nice histories of the automobile industry which go into this detail. I mean, our friends, the the Pfizer people, were known. 40, 50 years ago for doing exactly buying everybody that had an idea they didn't have and expanding it out to that way. That, to the, I thought that the pharmaceutical industry was more an example of what, what I was trying to talk about. It looks in the pharmaceutical industry as though there are some firms, think Pfizer or increasingly Merck and everybody else, who are really good at production Marketing, dealing with the regulators, people like that. And they do do some innovation in, in house, mainly to, to make sure that they can evaluate outside uh, innovators. But very often they wait for, for smaller enterprises to come up with some drug formulation and then they buy them out and they're using their specialized skills in, in a different area of the industry in order to get those products more quickly at the end. That's why I was suggesting that, that that's an alternative view of, of this whole process. You can think of some guys who are good at experimenting, trying out lots of different things, and then other guys who are really good at, at and maybe it could be some of them, some of them who are really good at scaling up 
And once you've settled on this sort of scope called dominant design, the guys who are really good at scaling up go up, you know, take off and you get the shake up. I'm trying to remember so you, the Holmes and Schmitz. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Exactly. Okay, well. Right, I'd forgotten that one, but yeah, that we we didn't think that we would get into the shakeout at all, um, not in this paper. Mm. But I think there is something attractive about treating both of those as integrated phenomena. You know the Bolton Harris model. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I think 99. Yep. It's one that I read about sharing information about bandits' realizations, right? So we look at each other's bandits and then we eventually, I don't know whether all end up pulling the same arm. Presumably so. I mean, uh, I'd have to look at the, 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 the heads. You know, so you explore, there was some exploration there of different bandits, even at a loss. Uh, and you, you expose it to different reasons. One is that, uh, yes, you wanted to get information yourself. And the second reason was that there was something called, they called an encouragement effect, which was that you pull an arm that is gonna give you losses in the hope that you'll get me to pull the same arm again. There's a subsequent uh, leverage that you get out of other people's actions on experimentation. So by experimenting yourself, you raise other people's experimenting activity. If you, if, if the, the belief that is close to the margin of pull, they had a discrete decision. So you either pull an arm or you don't pull it. And that's, that's what, that's all. That's, why am I talking about it? Because that's what I would think that the potential population of uh, arm pullers here is what we call K. Those are people involved in the industry and they're just, they're just not producing. They also are thinking about how to survive, what to do next, how to grow. Yeah, just like us. We're teaching what we're thinking of papers, how to, how to produce new, better. I thought a lot of their focus was on herding types of inefficiencies where you might get caught in the wrong arm just because you haven't done enough experimentation and stuff like that. I don't know if you want to go there, but anyway. The Arco and me did that. We got getting stuck. There's these things you could do, you get stuck, which was really Paul David who made that paper. You get, you get if you remember the Paul David paper, you, have a, you get along the average cost curve and you get so far down it that you say, no, I'm not gonna, the QWERTY was called QWERTY and the economics of something else. Do you remember that paper? Yeah, but you should be, you should be very aware that, that, the, uh, that the empirical work behind that was sh extremely shady because the bulk of the empirical work arguing that QWERTY was an inferior technology was financed by the main competitor to QWERTY. That there's a nice Journal of Law and Economics paper documenting that all the data that Paul David used came from this source, which had a compelling interest to argue that QWERTY was an inferior technology. I didn't know that. All right, so uh, let me just make an announcement and if you guys want to keep talking, it's fine. So uh, this, uh, so this concludes uh, Boyan's uh, talk. Um, and let's uh, thank, thank Boyan to give us uh, this nice presentation. And thank you, I tell you, what a great audience. That was great, thank you, Boyan. Send your comments, send you and me your comments. Thanks, yes. Boyan. Good to see you. Can I make two quick comments if uh, you're sticking around? Yeah, yeah, I'm sticking, sure. This is Matt. Um, first, I just thought in terms of thinking about the model to explain some, I think some of these things about alpha and so on. I mean, you have essentially a Leontief production for final output in capital that everyone has one unit of and an idea in a head. 
I don't mean ideas, I mean ideas in heads. And so ideas in heads are produced with one of two technologies. Either I can pay C to put an idea in my own head, like from the sky, or I can meet up with someone who already has an idea in their head and put it in my head. And the reason I think this is useful is because if you compare to Boldrin and Levine, in Boldrin and Levine, usually they think of what their sort of like alpha is kind of like one, except I can only charge you for the value of the idea I'm transferring to you. Whereas your alpha, if I set it all the way to one, I'm getting to soak up the rents from your capital. Now, that's very special when n goes to infinity because the rents from your capital when n goes to infinity take, a, I think, a very special form because there's, there's lots of capital. It's kind of like everywhere. Uh, so I think that may be part of the intuition for why n going to infinity is, is special because it's saying something about the, the scarcity of this capital, which is kind of like an invisible factor in your model. Um, but it helped me at least when I was trying to think through some of this stuff to think explicitly about why in Boldrin and Levine, alpha equals one is kind of optimal, but for you, it would be too high. Yeah, thanks. I would love to, there's so much to look at here. And can I, can I uh, talk about that? I mean, it, it, it seems true, but a, in your model, that capital is inelastically supplied. So there's no decision of whether to supply it or not. So I don't think it matters in this context. You don't think it matters? Okay, you, you're probably right. But doesn't it matter how I decide to allocate that half capital between putting an idea in its head now and waiting to until somebody bumps into me to put an idea in its head? Because that's what the planner's trying to. Right, no, I see, I see what you're saying, yeah. So we have this, the only cost we have is C, that could be the, the cost of conversion.